Why don't you take your Bible and stand with me? Let's honor the reading of God's Word tonight from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. John chapter 19. We're going to go tonight to John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, starting in verse number 23. And we'll read through verse number 27. John chapter 19, verse 23. In the NIV, it reads like this. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, which was the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. In verse 24, they said, let's not tear it. They said to one another, let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. So this is what the soldiers did. Verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Returning to verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood, and then it listed the people that were near the cross Friends, tonight I'd like to speak in this miracle service a message I'm simply going to entitle, Near the Cross. Father, we invite your presence in a supernatural way in this house. Lord, not only as a Christian, but as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I know this. I know that people can be healed even during the preaching of the word tonight. I know that miracles can manifest before a preacher ever lays hands on anybody. And that is my prayer tonight, God, that even during the preaching of the Word, the anointing would so fill this house in a supernatural, powerful way that their sick are healed while the preaching is going on, that broken hearts are mended, that broken people are restored, that people are delivered by the power of God. Lord, we release the anointing of heaven in this place right now. Anoint me to preach, anoint people to receive, and Lord, please know our hearts are expecting tonight. We believe you, so we ask heaven to come down and glory to fill our soul, even during the preaching of the Word. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated if you promise to amen the preacher. Well, we ought to have fun tonight. Yeah, we're going to. Note takers, again, we're going to be very intentional about helping you follow some things. We've looked at John's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. I want to preach on near the cross, the words in verse 25, near the cross. We're going to talk about two things tonight. We're going to talk about the sounds of the cross, and we're going to talk about the people that are near the cross. Before we get there, though, by way of introduction, may I just say to you so you know where I'm at on this particular subject where you know that I'm coming from. I still believe, ladies and gentlemen, that everything we are and hope to be is all centered around the cross. I don't want you to doubt that from this preacher. I believe everything the Lord did for us on the cross helps us get to where we are and where he wants us to be. It's still all centered around the cross. I'm about to show my age, but we used to sing a hymn in church all the time that was my favorite, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. It's still one of my favorites, ladies, and even though we don't sing it much. And I want to tell you, every need represented in this house tonight, 
can be found at the cross. Everything we need can circle back to there, ladies and gentlemen, at the cross of Jesus Christ. If you need physical healing, it's going to come from what Jesus did on the cross. By his stripes, you are healed in Jesus' name. And all the sick say, I receive that. Come on, I receive that. I'm saying, I'm going to receive what happened on the cross. If you need deliverance, it's going to come from the cross. If you need bondages broken in your life, if you got a dick, it's going to come from the cross, Lady Jen. What happened on the cross and what we're going to look at tonight is everything we need in this place. First thing I want to talk to you about are the sounds that came from the cross. The sounds. That, and I would say to this church tonight, there is absolutely no way that I can adequately with my words paint a picture for you about exactly what being there that day sounded like. The moaning, the things that I have read regarding the crucifixion, and we understand, boy, this is the crucifixion. You know, this is kind of an Easter message. But may I say to us as Pentecostals, can I just say... I still believe we ought to be excited about the fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead 365 days a year. Not just at Easter time, ladies and gentlemen. Everything we are and hope to be is centered around what happened on the cross, and Jesus prophesied it himself in three days. I'm going to raise myself up, and he did it, ladies and gentlemen. And that is something to rejoice about 365 days a year, not just at Easter time. Be thankful for what he did on the cross, and be thankful that he rose again. If we were there, we would have heard the sounds of the soldiers pounding the nails, the moaning, the screaming. Remember, Jesus already had the stripes on his back at this point. Can you imagine sweat running into an open wound, burning and stinging? They say that the way that he was hanging on the cross, Bible scholars tell us there, there's no way that it was not hard for Jesus to breathe, even. Gasping, moaning, the sounds of nails. And then the people at the cross, all the weeping and the crying that's going on. What a horrible, horrible sound. It must have been on that day. And there's no way, with my words, I can help us grasp that. But I think we all would agree tonight, it didn't sound good. There's no way. There, there, there's no way that it did. And then second, and I'm going to preach my entire message on my second point about the people that were near the cross would you please give me just a moment to set this up tonight because the cross is important. First of all, I want to tell you that at that cross, there were four Roman soldiers at the cross. But Trinity, what I want us to understand is those soldiers were there out of duty. Are you tracking with me? It was their job. They weren't there because they believed in Jesus. They weren't there because they cared about Jesus. It would not have mattered who was hanging on the cross. It was their job to be there. And to them, that's all it was. Four soldiers there completely out of duty. That's it. There was nothing in their heart. There was nothing in their emotion. With all the sounds that were being heard, they were unaffected. They were just doing a job and going to get a check at the end of the week. They were there completely out of duty. 
But there are others that were there. In our text tonight, the Bible said that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Salome, his mother's sister. Mary Magdalene was there. John, the beloved disciple, was there. They were all there, not out of duty, but hear me, Trinity. They were there because they loved Jesus. They were broken hearted. They were confused. And they wanted to be near the cross. I wonder if we had been there that day, would we have been one of the ones that pushed up near the cross or we w- would we have been watching from a long way off? Would we have said, no, I know this is going to be the worst day for Jesus, my Lord and Savior, but I'm going to push right. I want to be there. I want to be supportive of him. I, I want to get up near the cross. But as you and I have just discovered in Scripture, Most people weren't near the cross. They were watching from a long way away. But I want to show you tonight, before we pray, that these people that got near the cross had a reason and a purpose for being there. I want to walk you through this. First of all, I want to talk to you about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, for your notes, represents a place of redemption. A place of redemption. Now, friends, let me take you back, please, to a story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse number 2. It is in Luke 8, 2 that it tells us this woman, Mary Magdalene, was the woman who Jesus had cast out seven demons. Hear me, church. Seven demons that made her do terrible things. They wrecked her mentally. They wrecked her physically. They wrecked her emotionally. And the entire purpose of those demons was to destroy her life. She was hopeless and helpless But now the man that's hanging on the cross stepped into her life and delivered her and redeemed her of an emotionally wrecked life. And she represents a place of redemption. The Lord took her from a miserable condition to being delivered of seven demons. It's no wonder, she said, I'm going to get up there close. I'm going to be next to this man. Seven demons. Bondages. Addictions. Physically, mentally, emotionally wrecked her life. Caused her to do things she would never do in her right mind. But Jesus stepped into her life and delivered her and redeemed her. And she said, you can watch from a long way off, but this man saved my life. I'm getting up close. He redeemed me. When I was controlled by seven demons. Trinity, redemption cost a lot. It cost a lot. For you and I to move from darkness to light, Jesus had to move from light to darkness. It cost a lot. For you and I to be delivered from guilt to forgiveness, Jesus had to be made sin for us. It cost a lot. For Jesus to make us rich with blessings, he had to become the poorest of the poor. So I'm standing before you right now, and I'm saying to you, I completely understand why when we're reading the Scripture, we read that Mary Magdalene is up near the cross. I get it. That man on that cross had done for her what nobody else could do for her. She would have been dead a long time ago if it wasn't for that man on the cross. 
He saved her. He redeemed her. And I know there are people in this house tonight that know what it is to be redeemed by the power of Jesus Christ. Not just saved, but over and over. He has taken you from where you are were to where you are right now. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And boy, Mary Magdalene. She was bound, but she was delivered. I'm not watching from a long way off. Uh-uh. The rest of y'all can go do that. But this man saved my life. And at his worst moment, I will not forsake him. I'm going to be near the cross. Redemption. When I think about redemption by way of illustration, I think about coupons. Anybody use coupons but me? I'm going to tell you, uh, on my phone, I got all the apps that gets me those points, that gets me free food. Oh, I got my wife will tell you. I pull them out at McDonald's, Chick-fil-A. It don't matter. McDonald's, I'm telling you, under the anointing, McDonald's, they'll give you free French fries on Friday. Now, that's a spiritual moment for me. Huh? And I, I'm going to cash up Chick-fil-A. Give me a free chicken sandwich. I'm taking it, baby. I'm in. But now watch this. Watch this. If I'm going to redeem those coupons, I have to go to the right place. For I can take that coupon for that free french fries and I can take it over to Burger King and they don't give a rip they not giving me free french fries cause that's not who can redeem the coupon some of y'all about to preach with me that's it means nothing to them but if I take it to the right place I can cash that in. I can, if y'all don't smile, I'm going to preach till midnight. You track, you track it. If I take it to the right place, I can redeem that, and it becomes valuable to me. I didn't say good for me. I said valuable, valuable to me. But you got to go to the right place. I'm going to tell you, if you're struggling with addiction in this house tonight, the bar is not the right place. I'm going to tell you, if you're struggling with addiction tonight, X-rated movies is not the right place. Those things are not going to redeem you. They are not going to change your life. But there is a man in this house tonight... That if you will come to him, he's the right place and he can do for you what he did for Mary Magdalene. He can deliver you from addiction. He can release you from bondage. He can heal your body. He can heal your mind. He can deliver you from depression. Don't make me preach up in here. He can do whatever you need and he is the right place place for us to go and re get redemption, Lady Jack. He's the right place. So Trent, can I tell you tonight, Trendy? let's get up near the cross, okay? I don't, don't sit back tonight. Don't sit back and look. No, no, no. That man that hung on the cross is walking the aisles of Trinity Assembly tonight. He's in the house, and he redeemed Mary Magdalene, and he can redeem us. Sing him. He's the right place. And for Mary Magdalene, it represented a place of redemption. Friends, would you agree with me? No wonder she got up near the cross. Huh? Man. Nobody in this house knows what it's like to have seven demons in you. Wives, don't look at your husband right now. I'm joking. We don't know. There's no way we know, really, the magnitude of what Jesus did for this woman. It represents a place of redemption. She was near the cross. 
The second person there, Salome. Now, she represents a place of rebuke. Oh, I was preaching so good until now, wasn't I? See, Mary Magdalene represents a place of redemption, but she represents a place of rebuke. Can I take you back in Scripture to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, and verse 20 through 23? Do you remember this story? Because most Bible scholar commentators identify this woman as the wife of Zebedee and the mother of James and John. And the reason I say a place of rebuke, do you remember the story when, whenever she came up to Jesus and she said to the Lord, Lord, it should be my two sons that sit on your ride. And wave at me if you remember that story. Do you remember that? It ought to be my boy. Mama loves her boys. <laughs> and so we're going to get somebody on the right and somebody on the left. And Jesus, I just think it ought to be my boys. They're the best. They ought to sit on the right. And and do you remember in that story now, Jesus rebuked her gently. Ma'am, that's not even mine to give. But you're totally thinking wrong. Remember what Jesus said? You're totally thinking wrong. We're all about serving here. It's not about getting up next to me and getting glory and fame. It's all about serving. You see, friends, she did not understand that suffering often comes before reward. Suffering often comes. Listen, there is no crown without the cross. You got to first drink the cup of suffering. Even Jesus' path to heaven Went through the cross. She represents a place of rebuke. Because if I can be honest with you tonight, we all at times represent selfish desires in our own life. Oh, don't let me kill revival spirit, friends. It's at the cross where we can be rebuked in light of our own selfishness and desires. Listen, maybe, maybe, maybe you're not like me. I, I don't know, but I'm just going to confess something before the house. And I'm just going to tell you, there are a lot, a lot of times I'm praying in an altar, wherever I'm praying at. And I mean, it happens to me a lot, folks. I'll stop and get convicted while I'm praying, and all of a sudden it dawns on me. I'm spending way, way, way more time Asking God for something than thanking Him for what He's already done for me. Way more. Lord, I need this. I need that. I need this to have. I would you do, and all of a sudden I get, I want you to lift your hand in this house if God has been good to you. Come on. Hasn't He all? Come on. I say it tonight. If God doesn't do one more thing for us, He still deserves praise. He still deserves glory. He still deserves to be lifted up. He's a good God, and He continues to be good, and His mercies never end, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't want to get caught up in selfishness. I always want to take time when a revival spirit and say, Thank you, Lord, for a roof over my head. Come on. Thank you, Lord, for food on my table. Thank you, Lord, for clothes on my back. Thank you, God, for a car to drive. Folks, he's been good to us. Don't forget to thank him. Don't forget. Now, she's there in a place of rebuke when she got convicted now she realized what it's all about everybody smile even if you have to fake it because just because he rebukes us doesn't mean he don't love us and it took her a long time to get that but now she knows it now she understands the Lord was gentle with her in rebuking her But she still said at the end, I'm going to be near that cross because he helped me with my selfishness. The third person I want to talk to you about is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene represented a place of redemption. Salome represented a place of rebuke. 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, represents a place of reward. A place of reward. Can we think about the mother of Jesus just for a moment? Can I pull back just teaching points and let's remember all that she went through? So much suffering brought her to this place of reward. Can you imagine the shame and reproach that she suffered being a teenage girl found with child before married to Joseph? Can you imagine all the gossip that went on, all the shame? She suffered emotionally. She fled Egypt to save her child. But then many innocent children died because of her child. Emotionally, mentally. Jesus' mother went through a lot. A lot. And she's there. But it's a place of reward and she doesn't even know it. Because hanging from the cross, beaten and bleeding. Did you see in our text... Jesus looked down, and he begins to have a conversation with his mama. Right from the cross, he knows that he's about to die. He's in so much pain, he can't even catch his breath. But in verse number 27, Jesus knew her suffering was going to be temporary, but her reward was going to be forever. So he looked at her in verse 27, and he said, Mom, I'm going to tell you something. I know this is a bad time. I'm about to die, but I want you to see John right here standing next to us. And John's going to take care of you for the rest of your life, Mom. I got to go, but I got you in good hands here. So this is your reward, Mom. John is going to be your son now. You're going to be his mama now. And so, Mom... I'm sorry, I wish I didn't have to go, but I got to go. But I'm not going to leave you without somebody taking care of you. John right here called him out. Did you see that in our text? Called him out. This John. John right here, he's going to take care of you, Mom. Here's your reward. All the pain and all the suffering that she had been through in her life. All the hurt and all the heartache. But now she stands at the foot of the cross, confused, not understanding what her son's saying. But she's getting a reward she don't even know about. May I say to every man, woman, and student in this house tonight, there's some pretty deep suffering in this gone on in this house. Some of y'all been through hell. Some of y'all in the middle of the storm right now. Some of y'all been through things that would have taken a lot of other people out. But may I remind you on this point that you do have a reward coming because of the man that's hanging on that cross. May I remind you that the Bible says if we suffer, we will also reign with him. May I remind you that he has gone to prepare a place for us, but he will come again, John 14, 1 through 3. He said, I'm going to come back after you, and then I'm going to take you, and where I am there, you're going to be also. It's hurt. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of pain. Some of you are broken in this house, but would you lift your head tonight and know that he's not going to leave us hanging in eternity, ladies and gentlemen, for great is our reward. Can I tell you, no, no, no matter how much pain you're in tonight, that moment you stand in the presence of God literally and he says to you, well done thou good and faithful servant, enter into the presence of the Lord. It will be worth it all, ladies and gentlemen, every hurt, every heart ache every pain it will be there's a reward coming I want you to know ladies and gentlemen there's a reward and some of you need a broken heart healed in this place tonight can I remind you the miracle workers here so we got a broken hearted mama standing at the foot of the cross but Jesus didn't leave her hanging I I just have one more I'm going to talk to you about and it's John John Now, John represents a place of responsibility. So may I, just for teaching, may I just continue to track along the same line as I've been preaching for the last five minutes. John stood there restored. 
Now, let me explain this to you. You see, friends, he, along with some other disciples, had forsaken Jesus and fled for their lives to the Garden of Gethsemane. They had forsaken Jesus, but John came near the cross. Why? Because even when we forsake him, he doesn't forsake us. John stood there restored and forgiven. Have you ever messed up and wandered away from the cross? John represents a place of responsibility. Jesus restored John. Now, it's always kind of humorous to me, and I love to bring this up in Scripture, because even Jesus said in the Scripture there, John, who is the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, Scripture references that quite a bit, but always what's humorous is to me, is to me about that is it was John that said it. <laughs> I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Y'all don't think it's as funny as I do, but I'm too. I think it's just hilarious. This is the disciple that Jesus loved. Really, who said that? John. He loved me. His disciple, as John said it, this disciple that Jesus loved. And that's the way he referred to himself in this story here. But he stood there restored. But the Lord said, listen. I'm going to give you some responsibility now. Please don't check out on me, church, because we have a responsibility before the Lord. John, this is my mother, and you're going to take care of her because I'm gone. I, I've got to go, but you're going to take care of my mom. John, this is your assignment. You are now responsible for this. So I'm going to give you a place of responsibility. I restored you after you walked away from me. But now, understand, you have a responsibility. Trinity, I'm going to tell you it is a responsibility that we have before the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's our responsibility to witness to the lost, ladies and gentlemen. It's our responsibility to bring people to church. Yeah, I'm just killing this here at the end. We have a responsibility to that man hanging on the cross. He's done so much for us. We have a responsibility to do something for him. And that's what John represented when he's standing there at the cross. I was waiting to board a plane recently. The plane had arrived, and several passengers were getting off. I was standing at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, and we were lining up, because as soon as those passengers got off, we were going to board that plane and go. I can't even remember where I was headed. But as we stood there, people are coming off, and all of a sudden, it looks as if to all of us that the plane is empty. That, and, and so we're wondering why they're not putting us you know, on the plane, we're all kind of standing. I'm actually second in line. There's a lady ahead of me. We're just all standing there waiting. All of a sudden, from the, the runway, the bridgeway there, surfaced through the door, was one of the workers pushing a wheelchair with a man in it. So it dawned on all of us now, we understand, why it was taking longer. They were helping the man in the wheelchair get off the plane. As the man was pushed right by us, I noticed he had a hat on that identified himself as a veteran. As he was pushed by us, an elderly man, the woman in front of me looked down at him and said, Sir, thank you for your service. The elderly man could, could barely speak. He obviously couldn't walk. He reached up and he took his hat off. I'll never forget it. And with soft, feeble words, he looked up at that woman and said, Ma'am, I did my best. And he put his hat back on, and they pushed him away. Maybe that story didn't impact you the way that it impacted me. But as a preacher of the gospel and a follower of Jesus Christ, I can tell you at that moment I was ushered to judgment day, standing before the Lord. From that moment on, I have had that illustration in my mind because you're listening to a preacher tonight that wants to stand before God at the end 
and say, Lord, I did my best. I didn't cut corners. I didn't slack in my prayer life. I didn't miss church because I was lazy. I did my best, God. I, I gave it my best. I, I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and just say, boy, I just halfway represented. There are times I could have done better. We've all been there. Come on. Come on. We've all, times I could have done better. But I don't want to stand before God. No, I, I want to stand and say, Lord, I did my best. And as convicted as I am tonight by my own sermon, I'd like to tell you that, boy, if I was there, I'd have been right up near that cross. I'd like to think I would have because of all He's done for me. But then I view this and go, my Lord, there's only four people there. Everybody else is gone. You see, friends, and I'm closing a place of redemption reminds us it all began at the cross. A place of rebuke reminds us that all pride and selfishness pales in comparison to what He has done for us. A place of reward reminds us that even in our own suffering, He rewards the faithful. He rewards the faithful. I'm going to echo it again and tell you He rewards the faithful. But a place of responsibility says to us, go and do the work He's called us to do. Because in all the blessings, we still have a responsibility. I don't know about you, but I want to end these three service, three revival services we've had. I want to end near the cross. I want to be found right up next to Jesus tonight. It's not his best moment. In fact, it's his worst day. But I'm not going to leave. Because of all he's done for me. And if you need anything tonight, you're going to find it near the cross. Father, thank you for the high price that you paid on the cross that day. On the cross, thank you. Lord, I pray every person in this room would be found near the cross tonight. Lord, some are sick in body. Some need emotional healing. Some need mental healing. Some need deliverance from bondages in their life. So it's my prayer that everybody will push up next to the cross. I want to be near the cross tonight. Before I even start the altar call, would you take 60 seconds just seated right where you are? Would you lift your hands to heaven and just ask the Lord to help you to do your best? Would you do that, Lord? I, I don't want to cut corners. I don't want to slack in my Bible reading, my prayer time. I don't want to slack in my church attendance. Lord, I want to stand before you one day and say, I did my best. I did my best. Lord, collectively help Trinity Assembly give it their best. Individually, would you help us give it our best? I want to be near the cross. Thank you, church. Would you stand with me?